Hi, I'm Rusty Dornan from the Kaufman Fellows Academy, and once again we're welcoming back Brad Feld, author of Venture Deals, and our illustrious instructor in the online class, Venture Deals. Welcome back, Brad. Um, we're going to be talking about term sheets again. We talked about it with Jason Mendelson last week. Uh, first off, I, you know, I have a couple questions. Um, you, how much homework do you do on founders before you sign a term sheet as a VC? Well, the two primary things that uh, that we focus on from investor perspective around the founders is uh, the backgrounds of those founders and what they've done and more importantly how interested we are in working with them and how interested they are in working with us. So it's not like a series of reference checks and you know, looking at resumes and stuff like that. In fact, I can't remember the last time I looked at somebody a founder's bio. It's spending time with them. It's interacting with them. It's working with them. You know, on something, digging into their product, and just seeing what that interaction is like. And then the second part of it is we're really looking for founders who are completely and totally obsessed with their product. And it has to be a product that we have affinity for, but we really want the founders to be so obsessed with what they're doing. And those two parts of the evaluation actually tend to fit well together, right? Is is this person just obsessed about what they're working on? And do we want to work with them and do they want to work with us? What's a red flag to you about a founder? Uh, just, you know, initially and then also maybe there are activities that they're doing on the side. Is that a red flag? Yeah, I, I, think, I think we want founders who are all in on what they're working on. So if they're working on multiple things, that's bad. Um, uh, I think founders who are sort of blasé or nonchalant about what they're doing. In other words, they're not obsessed about their product. It's kind of they could work on any product, and this happened to be the thing that they're working on. Um, oftentimes, there's more than one founder. I'd say, you know, not all, but most of the companies that we back typically have two or more founders. Um, the interaction between those founders and how they relate to each other is super important to us. So if we see friction or tension between the founding team or you know, one founder who really dominates the other founders where it's not really a set of founders, but it's one person with some other people. Like, we're looking for that sort of nuance. Um, another red flag, uh, frankly, is responsiveness. Um, we try to be hyper-responsive to the people we work with. I'm sure we, you know, we fail at it sometimes, but we try hard. Um, you know, the, I think founders, especially when they're raising money, really need to be uh, on top of what is effectively a sales process, right? They're trying to execute you know, this dynamic of building relationships with potential investors. And it's it's really the entrepreneur's responsibility to manage that dynamic. And so entrepreneurs who run open loop, entrepreneurs who kind of, you know, aren't focused on the fact that they're fundraising and trying to develop a relationship, that's that's bad. And then, you know, the last is is uh, probably in the category of, of miss on a cultural norm. So we have a set of things that we care a lot about that are our own cultural norms at Foundry Group and the way that we think about things and do things. And if somebody is far from our cultural norm in terms of their behavior, their morals, their ethics, you know, they lie, they're disingenuous, they obfuscate the truth, they sort of, you know, say one thing and do another, that's not going to be interesting for us to want to work with, with that person. And I see some people are joining us uh, for the chat, so anytime you guys want to ask questions, please go ahead and type them in. For Brad Feld, we're talking about term sheets today. Um, what are some of the ways investors can really tie up the process with a term sheet, and, and uh, how, what can entrepreneurs do about it? Well, there, there's two categories of investors in the context of, of, of the process. There's a category of investor that tries really hard to create a sense of urgency for the entrepreneur, tries to take control of the process, you know, does things like put, um, you know, uh, uh, an exploding time on the offer. This term sheet's only good till, you know, 48 hours from now. And I would say, while there's an artifact of that in a lot of term sheets, the vast majority of investors who are high quality investors um, don't hold uh, entrepreneurs, especially ones that have competitive deals to that kind of thing. Um, as an entrepreneur, it's important to not overplay your hand, though. If you're in a situation where you're setting an expectation as to what your process is, you should execute your process. Um, you know, and, and if, if you do say, hey, look, I'm looking for best offers by this date, and you've got five people that put in term sheets, 
That doesn't mean that you can't go back to the one of those five investors who's the investor that you really want and saying somebody else offered a higher price, you know, we want you to move your price up. But I think that there is this sense from investors, especially when, you know, they know that it's not a competitive deal to try to get ahead of the process uh, and, and tie up the entrepreneur by saying, if you don't make a commitment to be on such and such a date, uh, you know, the deal's not going to uh, still be there. Again, there's a, a group of investors who are like that. I'd say it's a relatively small group. I think most investors, especially in situations with high-quality entrepreneurs, are pretty, I don't want to say relaxed about it, but they recognize that the entrepreneur has options and that it's not really in their best interest as an investor to force the issue. Instead, they should you know, be as responsive as they possibly can in the process. Okay, we're starting to get a few questions. Um, do you view startups coming out of an accelerator as a plus point? Is that a checkbox in your assessment? Well, I'm a co-founder of Techstars, so we're we're big fans of Techstars and what Techstars has done as an accelerator. Of the 70 or so companies that Foundry Group has funded since 2007, I think about 10 of them have gone through uh, through Techstars. So, you know, we certainly believe that some accelerators, uh, you know, provide uh, a lot of a lot of benefit and a lot of value to the companies early on. I don't view it as a check mark, however. In other words, it's not the case that just because somebody's gone through an accelerator means that their company is a high quality company or that they're on a particularly interesting path to us. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we deeply engage with TechStars. So instead of viewing it as an accelerator, where you know we sort of sit back and wait for somebody to say, "Oh, well, we went through TechStars, therefore we're better." we get to know them while they're in the accelerator, we work with them, we actively mentor the companies that we're interested in, and we actually mentor a number of companies that we know we're not going to invest in, but we just want to be helpful to the ecosystems that we're participating in. So, you know, I would tell entrepreneurs that accelerators, high quality ones, provide a lot of benefit, um, but make sure that you get out of it what you put into it. Um, if all you're trying to get out of it is just the label that you went through the accelerator, you're wasting your time. If you're trying to actually get something really useful out of it, that's good. Well, you know, entrepreneurs always get tough questions on that, you know, first round of funding. Uh, you know, a couple of them are, you know, what pre-money valuation are you expecting and who else are you talking to, assuming there's other VCs. How do they answer those questions? What's the best way for them to do it? The best way to answer it is to tell on the uh, on what valuation are you expecting, you know, not to be coy, but just to say, look, you know, we don't, we expect the market to tell us. Right, and most investors will ask the question, and if you give them a response like that, most of them understand that it's their responsibility to make an offer and tell you what price they're willing to pay to invest in your company. Uh, the other question is exactly the same: What other people are you talking to? Some are, some investors will ask that question. A lot won't because they recognize that you know most good entrepreneurs are not going to be responsive to that. Most good entrepreneurs should say, "We're talking to a bunch of different people, names that you know, some that you might not, um, but we're looking for." a particular investor or a set of investors who are going to be really additive to our company. So I don't believe that an entrepreneur has a responsibility to answer either of those two questions. And in fact, you know, while, while there are many questions that you'll, you'll be asked around uh, different things, those are probably the two that are the least interesting uh, to be responsive to. Uh, when he said, uh, if, uh, it appears that having multiple term sheets is the ideal situation, but since windows on a term sheet might be limited, how can you orchestrate this process? Well, uh, this comes back to the thing I said a little bit earlier. While the windows might be limited, um, uh, you know, a good on a good investor who really wants to invest in your company, you know, that understands he or she is in a process, will be somewhat flexible on that specific date. The issue is if you get a term sheet and you don't respond to the term sheet for six weeks. Um, that term sheet's not going to be there. If you get a term sheet and you respond and you, you know, essentially it takes you a day or two, you know, to get back to uh, the person with specific feedback on the term sheet and then, you know, another day or two of haggling back and forth. I mean, you know, you kind of have about a week's worth of time. So one approach is to slow roll the process, be responsive but not overly responsive. Um, but communicate what you're doing and what your time frame is. I got to talk to my board. I need to talk to my other investors. I need to get my lawyer to mark up the term sheet. The other dynamic is to be clear that it's a competitive situation, and you're expecting, you know, term sheets to come in. You know, you expect that you'll have all of them by Friday, and you know, put your best foot forward and tell that to the folks, you know, as term sheets are starting to come in. The only risk there is if you actually don't have any term sheets coming in and you know, nobody shows up on Friday, then you have a different set of problems. So you shouldn't sort of make the call for term sheets until you're confident that either one is about to come or you've got one in hand and 
you know, now you're just hustling to get the rest of the people around the table to, to show their hand. Uh, from one of the Venture Deal students, Santosh Rajani says, I want term sheets from angels, like this morning my beta signups are running at 35%. What should I do? What should I not do? Well, angels are tougher to get term sheets out of for a variety of reasons. A lot of angels are followers, not leads. So the angels will say, you know, I'm, uh, I'm good for 50000 or I'm good for $100,000 in a financing that you put together. So, you know, there are a lot of different tactics depending on the amount that you're raising, and those tactics range from um, doing something like a convertible note where uh, you essentially are presenting the note to the angel. You're saying here are the terms, you know, for you to invest it in the angels then, either putting up or shutting up in, in that context, or you know, trying to put together a round using one of the angels as the lead um, to help you set price and set terms and rally things around. Also then using you know, sites like AngelList can be very, very powerful if you've got some angels who are interested and are willing to commit, but not until sort of a, a certain critical mass of money starts to come together, especially if those angels are active on AngelList, uh, that can be a, a good momentum builder for you. Uh, from Derek LaCroix, if you rejected a startup, are you interested at all in hearing from them again to see what improvements have occurred? And if so, how many deals like that have you seen? Yeah, we're, we're very interested, and there's quite a number of companies that we passed on in the first round and then subsequently invested in, in a, later, or a later round for a variety of reasons, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Urban Airship is a company that we're a major investor in. They're up in Portland. Um, I, I saw the seed round and uh, I passed on it. I just wasn't really that interested in it at the time in terms of how they described what they were doing. It didn't sort of click into my brain that it was compelling. And about a year later after they raised that seed round, they came back around. My partner Jason uh, bumped into them and, you know, he mentioned it. And I said, yeah, I met with them. Let's, how are they doing? And they were doing really, really well. And it was still the same basic business, but there was a lot more clarity on where they were going and who was going to buy what they did. And so we ended up leading that next round. Um, another example would be a company called uh, Sympose, which uh, my partner Jason knew the entrepreneur probably for two or three years. Didn't really like the original business that they were starting to execute. They raised a small round of financing from, from some other folks. He stayed as an advisor. He liked the two founders, stayed close to them, um, gave him a lot of feedback. And I remember you know, when Jason reached out to me about it, I was in, in, uh, in Paris for a vacation and he he literally sent me an email and says, hey, can we talk about this, this thing? You know, take a look at this deck. Uh, don't laugh. And uh, he sent me over the deck, and it was uh, uh, Simpost has a site called Craftsy, which is an uh, online video and training site for things like crafts, knitting, needlepoint, woodworking. And they were doing, you know, growing very, very quickly. Uh, and, and his reaction was, you know, I know these guys for a long time. I think they're executing really well. But I feel like this kind of feels a little weird to me to be investing in a knitting site. Uh, and my reaction, you know, looking at the business, looking at the site, and looking at the uh, the numbers was, you got to be kidding me. This is awesome. We should definitely, you know, these guys, you like them, go for it, right? So it, it's it's not the case that it's, uh, you know, we pass, we never want to talk to you again. Um, but it's really the entrepreneur's responsibility in a lot of ways, you know, to build that and develop that relationship if we're willing to stay engaged. Yeah, I mean, that's just a follow-up question. I mean, is it is it a good idea for the entrepreneur to say, hey, I realize you passed. Can you give us kind of a quick guideline of what you'd like to see us do and to get to the point that you might yeah, consider us? It varies, uh, and it varies on the, the level of engagement. So, you know, if somebody sends me an email and I take a look at an executive summary or I take a look at a paragraph or two email or click through the deck that somebody sends me and I decide it doesn't fit in our themes, it's not something I want to invest in, and I just give a quick pass on it. Asking for me to engage more at that level, not that impactful, right? If it's somebody that I've spent time with face-to-face, -face, I've given some feedback to, decided not to invest in it, um, oftentimes uh, the feedback is feedback that is trying to be helpful to them and them staying engaged and building on that relationship and, you know, and reaching out on a periodic basis to give an update as well as to say, can you help me with this or do you have any feedback on this? Um, that's That's... Uh, a good and a powerful engagement dynamic. So I think it, it has a lot to do with that. I think it also has a lot to do with the firm that you're dealing with. Some firms are very happy to stay involved and, and you know, coach and, and give some quick feedback. Others are just really uninterested in that. So I think a little bit of it is you have to know the firm. If it's, if it's a seed investor and all they do is seed investments and they pass on you, probably not worth, you know, spending time for the next round. If it's a, a firm that likes to do 
you know, early stage, but then also mid and later stage investments, building a long-term relationship is probably useful. Last comment I'd make on that is, again, put, your, put yourself in the other person's shoes. If you can do something helpful to my world or you engage with my world in a useful way, my willingness and interest in engaging with you to be helpful to you goes up, right? So if you're willing to put some energy into the relationship with me, not knowing what's going to come of it, oftentimes that, that builds level of engagement from me. Recognize that I'm on the receiving end of 100 people a day asking me to help them, and I'm triaging that and saying no to an awful lot or trying to help people in a very lightweight way, but that doesn't really build relationships. So people say, well, how do you get the attention of you know, Fred Wilson or Brad Feld or somebody else? You know, if we blog, comment on our blog posts. Um, if you see companies in our portfolio that your company can be helpful to, that's good business for your company. Ask for introductions. Try to reach out to the company directly. Do something, you know, in and, in and around our world that touches our world in some way uh, that's additive. Uh, this has to do with founders' activities. You know, do, uh, to what degree do you appreciate contribution to the startup ecosystem, like mentoring or organizing events, versus single-minded focus on developing their product and business? Well, uh, you know, having having written an entire book on it called Startup Communities, um, I think that on startup communities have to be led by entrepreneurs. So I think it's very very important for entrepreneurs to participate in their own uh, startup communities. By the way, I don't think that that's altruistic activity. I think most entrepreneurs can do it in a way that's very self-interested for their business. And I'll give you an example. Um, I once had a person say to me, uh, you know, a, a good entrepreneur here in Colorado said, I don't have any time to spend with the startup community. I'm just too busy looking for iOS developers. I can't find any iOS de developers. There just aren't any, and I've got to spend all my time finding iOS developers. And I said, well, why don't you start a meetup in your office that happens once a month, and buy pizza and beer and do a meetup for all the iOS developers in town. And the guy sort of thought about it for a minute and he said, yeah, I'll try that. And, you know, a year later he had, you know, the most popular meetup around iOS developers. He had, you know, regularly 50 people showing up in his office, different people, somebody new to town or somebody new to iOS development would show up. And, you know, he had hired and his company had hired a number of really high quality iOS developers and they developed this reputation, not just of, you know, being a good place to work if you're an iOS developer, but also having built community for iOS developers, which attracted more people. So you can do things like that to contribute in a way uh, that's self-interested. I like to think about it as allocate about 10% of your time as, as an entrepreneur um, to working outside your business on the startup community in a way that reflects back on your business. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's a lot, um, but it's not a disproportionately large amount. Let's jump back to a term sheet uh, question. How do the terms from a previous round, especially the bad ones, how will it affect your offer to the founders in the round you might invest? If, uh, if your company is doing amazingly well, you'll have some negotiating leverage. If your company is doing okay, the terms will probably get inherited. So sort of the default for most later rounds is to use the terms from previous rounds. In later rounds, um, if, if you are in a position where, you know, you have a company that's doing extremely well and you have multiple people trying to invest in your company, then you have some leverage over eliminating the terms that you don't like from the earlier rounds. Okay. There are many parameters in a term sheet. As an investor, do you use the standard set of numbers to initiate negotiation with the startup you are interested in for a given level of development, or do you propose terms independently for each startup? We don't have any standards. I mean, I, I think the market moves around, things change over time. You know, I think we have general sort of ranges that we're comfortable with based on, you know, the progress that a particular company has made. We, we're, as a firm, uh, Foundry Group doesn't chase valuation, so, you know, there's plenty of companies that we were interested in that, you know, the valuation ended up getting high and silly, and, you know, we said, look, you're better off with those other investors. Um, but we're also not on the other end of the spectrum sort of overly obsessed about it and trying to grind down to the best incremental bit of terms. We try to be fair coming out of the gate and then be a little flexible in the context of what's important to the, uh, the entrepreneurs. In terms of, you know, first impressions, uh, which is often for some the pitch deck, what are the top five things in a pitch deck that can get you excited about an investment? Show me the product front and center. Um, show me, don't tell me. The more you can show me versus tell me about what you're going to do, the more you can show me of what you're doing and what you've done. 
and how things work and why things work, uh, the more interested um, uh, I'm going to be in engaging with you. Um, you know, very, very long decks with lots of words on them, less interesting than short things that, you know, help me process quickly whether it's something I want to engage in or not. Um, I hate pitches via video as the first starting point. You know, sending me a 10-minute video that I have to watch is so much less efficient and interesting to me than if you send me something I can look at for 60 seconds and make a quick uh, reaction to it. Uh, and then keep keep the bullshit out of it. Don't Don't, you know, overstate your position. Don't obfuscate reality. You know, don't uh, don't show me a revenue number without a gross margin number. If your gross margin is, you know, uh, not 99%, which, by the way, most companies don't have a 99% gross margin. Um, you know, don't show me an XY graph without uh, labels on the X and Y axis. So, you know, give me a sense as to what scale is. And, you know, be aspirational. I'm not saying be purely factual and rearview looking, but don't don't overplay, don't overplay your starting point. Show me your big vision. Tell me why I should care quickly. Get to the meat of that. Give me some substance and, and stay on showing versus telling. Um, what's your advice for entrepreneurs to choose early advisors? Would What would be the key criteria? And should startups try to show the team's progress before talking to experienced advisors? Uh, as an entrepreneur, you're collecting people all the time. So collect the smartest, most capable people you can at whatever stage of your business you're at. And when you're very, very early and it's nascent and it's just an idea, you know, collect some advisors who you think can help you, um, are people who are investing in, in you, who are going to invest their time and energy in you, might or, not have any ex might or might not have any expectations for any remuneration of any sort. Um, and as your business grows, continue to look for people both formally and informally that, that can be additive. Um, so I, I don't think you can ever start too early, and I think you should filter very aggressively based on people who you think can be helpful to you um, versus I, I collected a bunch of famous names, look at these famous names, and then I call, you know, or email one of the, um, uh, you call one of the people who's a, you know, famous name. Oh, who is that? I don't remember. Oh, yeah, that person. Yeah, I traded an email with him once. You know, like, again, don't get value out of the people. That's much more important than the marquee on the, on the letterhead saying these are the people who, uh, you know, who are interested in what I'm doing. Uh, most of the conversation is about entrepreneurs pursuing investors, especially in the early stages. Is there ever a case where an investor might actively pursue a company? All the time. Yeah, we have lots of examples of the of the companies we funded where we've actively gone after and 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 decided we wanted to invest in a company and we're proactive about reaching out. Um, I would say it's you know it varies a lot based on spectrum and stage as companies get bigger and more mature, there tends to be a lot more inbound and a lot more people sort of looking for later stage investments. At the earlier stage, um, you know, there's there's less of that unless you're a well-known entrepreneur or you're doing something that people, you know, sort of notice and uh, all of a sudden gets really hot before you've raised investors, but, or investment. But um, I think as an entrepreneur, you should make sure you're, you're in the places where potential investors are going to intersect with you well before you need to develop those relationships with the investors. So that even if they're not chasing you, there's lots of reasons for you to intersect. And so at the point at which you're raising money, um, it's available. There's a, 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 a friend of mine and a good mentor and co-investor, a guy named Walt Winchell, has a great parable. He says, you know, you're building your company. You want to build your company with glass windows. And you want people to be able to walk by the glass windows, you know, big giant glass windows, and see in. And they see all this stuff going on inside your company. Um, but the windows are closed. And every now and then, as they're walking by, they see all this stuff happening. Every now and then you open the window and say, hey, anybody want to come talk to us about investing in the company? The window's open for a little while. And at that moment in time, you want them to all show up at the window and want to participate because they've been walking back and forth and seeing what's going on. So many companies, you know, build themselves sort of in the dark. They keep it closed. They don't let anybody be exposed to it. And they don't try to develop any of those relationships until they have to raise money, at which point it's a bunch of people walking by the building. Oh, there's a startup in that building. How interesting. So I, I like that parable. You know, it's not exactly how it works, but this idea of being out there and letting yourself be known, again, not overplaying it, not being, you know, pom pompous and obnoxious and arrogant and annoying, um, but just participating. And this comes back, by the way, to one of the reasons to play in the startup community is that if you participate in the startup community, you get a lot of reputational benefit locally 
from other entrepreneurs so that when investors say, well, who are some of the people that I should really get to know? You know, who are some of the neat, hot new things that are coming up? The other entrepreneurs in town will point at you. Good. Okay, um, we have another one from a student, venture deal student. Getting ready to launch our MVP, it will start generating revenues. We need to pick a business, a legal structure, sole proprietor, C Corp, LLC, etc. What do you suggest at this stage that will be advantageous for the next steps when courting investors? Well, most most investors, uh, certainly most uh, uh, institutional investors, um, will want you to have um, uh, a C Corp. So you know, ultimately, you're going to have to end up being a C corp before you raise any money. It doesn't really matter whether you're a C corp, an S corp, or an LLC. And a lot of people start off with an LLC because um, it's relatively easy to set up. But you know, you're going to evolve to a C corp pretty quickly. So just sort of have your mind around that. Um, if you're never going to raise money, an S corp or an LLC is actually probably a better structure because of the tax dynamics around it. And sort of a bootstrap, self-funded company. Uh, is the geographical proximity of the startup still a criterion for investment? Um, it matters. Uh, it's not. Um, it's not an absolute, and it's changed a lot over the years. There used to be this sort of notion that you had to be physically close to the VC, or VCs would say, "I only want to invest in companies that I can drive to," and that was very prevalent, especially in Silicon Valley in the the 1990s. Uh, and then, you know, in 2003. Many of those same firms that had said that started setting up offices in China and India and investing halfway around the world. Um, you, you, you do see in major startup communities a lot of VCs that invest locally. So in the Bay Area or Seattle, you have firms like Madrona you know, that are very Pacific Northwest focused. Or in New York, you have a lot of firms that are more New York and Boston focused, vice versa. Um, and then you have firms like ours that are national in scope. So even though we're in Boulder, Colorado, we invest about a third of our investments in Colorado and about a third in the Bay Area and about a third everywhere else in the country. You know, so Boston, New York, Portland, Seattle, Austin, Chicago, whatever, D.C., whatever. So it depends on the firm and depends on the strategy of the firm. Um, I think that there are more places than ever before where you can start a venture-backed company. And interestingly, a lot of the cities that are a little bit off the beaten path tend to be really great places to start a venture-backed company because it's less expensive to start the business, it's less expensive to scale the business. The technical talent and the functional talent that you add uh, exists. And in some ways, you're not competing with as much noise. And that, you know, lines up against the backdrop of, you know, for example, the shtick that you hear over and over again from a lot of uh, people in the Bay Area that you have to be in Silicon Valley to, you know, be a credible tech entrepreneur. I just don't believe that's the case. Um, I believe there's an incredibly significant concentration of successful tech companies there. I think there's some magical stuff in the Bay Area uh, and Silicon Valley, but I think there's lots and lots of incredible companies that get built all over the world. So it, it in some ways it matters, but it matters in a different way than it might have 15, 20, 30 years ago. Okay. Is it okay to ask the angel for not only money, but also help in finding a co-founder or high-quality developers? Absolutely. Um, although, if you're looking for help finding a founder, uh, I'd almost encourage you to try to find your founders before you raise money. Like one of the challenges for an investor is if an investor is investing in a founding team that isn't fully formed, even if you come together for a relatively short period of time, you've picked each other versus the angel sort of using his or her network uh, to, to make that happen. That's not to say it's a bad thing. Um, and it's certainly not taboo if you need a co-founder. If you need a co-founder that you don't have, asking anybody in your network uh, uh, is is powerful. But recognize that it probably raises the bar some for that angel investor to, to pull the trigger and make the investment. Okay, we'll take our last question here. Have you participated in an AL syndicate? What are your thoughts about that model? A AL being angelist? I, I'm not sure. That's all he has is AL. Uh, so I'm going to assume it's, a, it's angelist. Uh, we, not only have I participated in a bunch, but uh, my partners and I at Foundry set up a syndicate called FG Angels. So I'm personally an investor in a handful of other syndicates on AngelList, but then we also have our own syndicate that we have a couple hundred investors in, and we've made, I think, eight or nine investments now in companies that have, have uh, listed and raised their rounds on AngelList. So we're big fans of the model. Just one last question. I mean, if what are the things that you really like to see entrepreneurs 
negotiate first? I mean, the things that they should really keep up front in terms of in, of the term sheet. Yeah, I think that, their minds. I, I think you know one of the things we talk about in the venture deals book that's so important is to really understand what's important to you as as the entrepreneur. And instead of negotiating every little thing that you can negotiate in the context of the term sheet, recognize that, that most of the important terms in the term sheet are either about uh, economics or control. And getting your mind around both of those issues and understanding what different things impact them. So for example, economics is not just you know the, the, the pre-money valuation, um, but it's how big your option pool is. Um, you know, your control issues are not just about, you know, number of board seats and who's on the board, but what the protective provisions are. So recognizing the really important terms and understanding how they link together, I think is important or critical. And then probably being clear with your investor about what matters to you makes a negotiation go more smoothly. If you're, you know, trying to pick off individual things and optimize everything versus saying this doesn't feel comfortable to us, or you have three, you know, three term sheets on the table and you're trying to figure out how to you know, get the term sheet oriented in the way that's best. You know, being systematic about it, I think, is uh, is is really important. But but understanding the economic terms and the control terms and knowing what matters to you and where your thresholds are, uh, is starting point. Do you have time for one more? One more. Yeah. All right. If an entrepreneur that doesn't have good VC connections or has limited connections is approached by a fundraising group with very good a very good reputation, should the entrepreneur accept, and what is the cost to do so? Well, so fundraising group with very good reputation is the key phrase. So very good reputation in whose mind? In, in their mind, in other entrepreneurs' minds, or investors' minds? So, you know, the very first question I ask anybody who approaches you and wants to try to help you raise money for a fee of some sort, whether it's cash or equity, um, is, you know, give me the list of the last, uh, you know, the last five or the last ten deals you did, including the ones that didn't get done. Um, and then go talk to those entrepreneurs and make sure that the person has actually raised money uh, or the group has raised money for the type of company you are and has the right kind of network. Um, recognize that most people that are are in a bank, you know, investment bankers or promoters, um, or are going to help you with fundraising are very good at at, at selling and promoting themselves. Um, oftentimes, over what they're able to actually execute on. So you know, be come at it skeptically. Second is, if you're a really early stage company, I think it's really impractical to try to have somebody else help raise you money. It's a good way to get into a lot of trouble. Um, uh, and I've seen way more unhappy situations than happy ones. So if you're very early stage, uh, again, be very careful and ask hard questions about what other companies at your stage they've successfully raised money from and whom. If you're later stage, oftentimes having a banker involved is helpful in terms of running or driving a process. Um, but, but, you know, same caveat supply. And, you know, for a lot of, a lot of investors, uh, having a banker involved uh, or somebody helping you fundraise versus being the entrepreneur, or the CEO driving it, is a negative indicator. So, from our frame of reference, you know, for an early stage deal, if it comes to us in the form of a PPM from an investment bank, it, you know, something doesn't feel right about that. So, again, know who your investors are and know whether the people that you're working with will really be able to get investor attention. Great. Brad, thank you so much for joining us today and also for all your thoughtful energy you've put into the Venture Deals class. I know the students really appreciate the answers that you've given to their questions. So uh, thanks again and uh, wish we were going to see you again. All right. See you soon.